Chapter 2 Screaming Ponies The Pony Pals went into Pam's house to, to hide from the dire wolves lurking outdoors and to make posters about the cat. Pam put big pieces of paper, pencils, and magic spell books on the kitchen table. As Anna drew a picture of the, the demonic cat, she thought about her Pony Pals. Pawnee, Indiana, was the Pony Pal who knew the most about local government. Her father was, was Ron Swanson. He went to restaurants and ordered all the bacon and eggs. He was the perfect man, his mustache like those of Emperor Tamarind Monkeys. Pawnee's mother was Leslie Nope. She had always been a loving parent, and she established many beautiful parks within the town limits of her daughter. But she ran off with Joe Biden when Pawnee was four years old. After that, Pawnee's father took a hard look at his life. He hated what he saw. He ran away. He lived in tents, rode elephants, and hid behind bushes to watch his ex-wife fool around with the vice president. Pawnee was heartbroken. She spent the next few years living with her uncles, Greg Daniels and Michael Schur. When she turned ten, she had a mental breakdown when she realized that she was simultaneously a human girl and an entire town with a population of 79,218. That's when she came to Wiggins to stay with her grandmother and try to forget about the inherent contradictions of her being. The large town thought she'd be bored living in, in a much smaller town. But then she met Anna and Pam and became a pony pal. Pawnee told Anna that she had more adventures being a pony pal than she did during the Pawnee Bread Factory fire of 1922. Anna and Pam Crandall lived in squalor all their lives. Of all the pony pals, Pam knew the most about gambling and casino heists. Pam's mother was a disgraced railroad tycoon. And the Crandalls had lots of jars of formaldehyde, and everyone was afraid to ask them why. Pam rode a pony you know, like a motherfucking maestro of equine flesh. Pam is to pony as Mozart is to piano, only better. Anna and Pam met in kindergarten when Anna showed Pam a drawing she made of Guernica. Anna is dyslexic, so reading and writing are more difficult for her. She is so goddamn dyslexic, the tense of this book changes when her dyslexia is being discussed. Anna held up the drawing she'd made of the black cat. That's perfect, said Pawnee with vicious sarcasm. You'll never make it as an artist, Anna, added Pam. Thanks, said Anna. You write the words, and I'll draw a cat for the next poster. She refused to let her friend see her cry. Pam printed the words on the first poster. Lost was an overrated TV show with an unsatisfying ending. Found on Main Street. A black male cat. He is fucking evil and likes ponies. Call, call our friend to make fun of her drawing. 555-3714. 555 phone numbers are the speed bumps of fiction. There you are, driving your metaphorical reading car, or your word wheels, as you call the car when you're feeling particularly synecdochic. Accelerating along Alliteration Avenue, but don't get too comfy in the driver's seat of that least 94 Kia, pal. Because you're about to get forcefully unimmersed from your literary experience by that patently fake phone number. Bam. Hope you didn't get bellatristic whiplash when your all-terrain allegory lurched over those three fives. You wanted to be engaged with the flow of the narrative? Too fucking bad, chump. The engagement's off. The groom ran off with his manicurist and left you holding the ring. The same kind of ring that you get if you tried calling a 555 number, i.e. none. Soon the three posters were finished. Let's ride into town and hit up the speakeasy, said Anna. The girls went out to the paddock. Anna knew her brain would collapse in on itself if she had to see the cute cat again. But the cat wasn't dreaming its unspeakable dreams next to Acorn anymore. I wonder where he went, Pawnee drunkenly slurred. She had a serious problem. Maybe he was just visiting, and now he's returned to his netherworldly dimension of eternal pain, Pam said hopefully. Anna pointed to Acorn's back. There he is, she giggled over the sound of Acorn's screams. Where? asked Pawnee. Then she giggled too. The cat was sitting on Acorn's back. He's the same color as Acorn's mane, said Pam. Black as Satan's heart and twice as evil. Anna lifted the cat off Acorn. 
Kitty. The knowledge that such a thing as you can exist makes me feel like Daedalus, trapped in my own ghoulish labyrinth, slowly starving to death. I hope that you get hit by a car. Let's put him in the animal clinic kennel while we're gone, said Pam. It's sad that our lives are so empty that we need to fabricate these little bullshit animal adventures to keep ourselves from constantly contemplating death. Pam took the cat from Anna and carried him to the animal clinic. Acorn thanked God that he'd be rid of the cat for a while, but God did not listen. For when you are a pony like Acorn, you must be your own God, an eternal slave to an egocentric spiral of self-worship. The Pony Pals rode on Riddle Road, which was home to the town Sphinx. After besting it in a furious battle of wits, they reached the post office. Anna ran in and pinned the poster to the back of the sturdiest mail carrier she could find. Next, they rode to Upper Main Street. Anna stayed with the ponies, while Pam and Pawnee rolled all their strength and all their sweetness up into one ball. The last stop was complete bullshit. Pam held the ponies while Anna and Pawnee did their insufferable lost cat shtick. Fuck. Why does Jean Betancourt waste the few remaining years of her life on these stories? What does she whisper to herself at night to justify her existence? And does the night listen? I'm going to buy the cat a toy, Anna told Pawnee. Maybe tempting the cat's playful spirit is the key to banishing the twisted energies crackling within its veins. Sure, said Pawnee, in the manner of a widow who has nothing left to lose, not even her sanity. Anna led the way to the pet section of the store. There were five different kinds of toys for cats. This is a distractingly specific and completely fucking pointless detail that contributes nothing to the story. This one is the least irradiated, said Anna. She held it up. A red plastic ball and yellow feather hung from a long piece of wire. Pawnee batted the little ball with her finger. A bell tinkled inside the ball. Holy fuck. Why is this toy being described so meticulously? Are we really expected to muster any fucks to give? He'll have fun with this. Pawnee croaked moistly. The girls rode back to the Crandalls. Needs an apostrophe. Crandalls apostrophe. Get your shit together, Betancourt. Anna went to the kennel room to see the cat. She held the toy above his head. He reached up with two paws to cast a particularly noxious spell. When the bell rang, he jumped back. Then he tried to communicate to Anna with his unfathomable eyes that he would immolate her in sulfurous flames if she startled him in this fashion again. Anna was oblivious. She thought this creature to be merely a rank-and-file minion of Hades. This underestimation would eventually prove fatal and worse. Later on, at the end of it all, Anna would think back on this moment, how innocent they had all been, especially Pawnee. Dear sweet Pawnee, she deserved this least of all, Anna would think, in that abstract future moment, when Anna, Pam, and the whole world were poised on the edge of... And then again, perhaps Pawnee deserved it more than any of them. There were six other animals in the clinic. Brandy, the German soldier of the Great War, was sound asleep. He had a big bandage around his belly. He looked so peaceful, curled up around his gummy mask and clutching his luger like that, Anna whispered to herself. And a little spike on his pickle hube is adorable. Oh, look at that diamond-shaped sunburst pip on the cord of his strap. That means he's an oberst ointment. Good for him. Anna lifted the cat out of his kennel and carried him outside. Acorn was reciting the names of the old gods in order of least to most tentacled near the clinic. When he saw the cat, he whinnied maliciously. The cat leaped from Anna's arms and ran over to Acorn. God averted his eyes, knowing what was soon to come. The cat stayed in the paddock with the ponies while the girls went in for dinner. The moment Anna's back was turned, Acorn trampled the cat like nobody's business. Acorn had already killed the cat once and was ready to do it as many more times as it took. Maybe this cat had nine lives, maybe nine million, but Acorn was patient. The cat couldn't keep coming back forever. It's fun to have a cat, thought Anna. Acorn hopscotched all over that fucker. 
He was like a steamroller whose drum had just been reforged into four glorious hooves and who hated cats more than Nikola Tesla hated the voltage leeches that lived in the pond outside his crystal electro mansion. After nearly a minute of trituration, Acorn looked proudly at the pulverized kitty curdles beneath his hooves. Crushing an enemy had rarely been so satisfying to him. Acorn felt as smug as the aforementioned voltage leeches did on the day in 1928 when they inevitably rose up, killed Tesla, crawled into his skull, and began controlling his body via electric shocks to his dead brain. That's right. For the last 15 years of his life, Nikola Tesla was actually just a colony of leeches that piloted his body as if it were a fleshy mecha from a weird Japanese anime. Pigeons and leeches, Jane. When you get right down to it, that's all we really are. Pigeons and leeches. But anyway, that whole aside just now was really dumb. Back to Acorn. Before the cat's blood had even congealed on his forelegs, Acorn saw what he knew he would. A black cat with white paws prancing towards him along the fence of the paddock. It will take more than that to kill me, Acorn, hissed the cat in the tongue of the beasts. Fuck you, snarled Acorn. Do you know why I'm here? the cat asked, while shitting disdainfully. Acorn was silent. Then allow me to enlighten you. The inky archfiend jumped onto Acorn's back and began to whisper his spiraling susurrations into the pony's ear. Suddenly, Anna woke up. She and her cronies were having a sleepover in her barn or the animal hospital or something. That's what happened in those boring-as-all-fuck paragraphs up there that I pasted over. What the ever-loving fuck woke me up, Anna wondered. She heard pounding hooves and screeching ponies. She dumped out of the sliced-open tauntaun carcass in which she slept. Pam! Pawnee! Anna shouted. Wake up! Something's wrong in the paddock! Shit just got real! Detective Pony was originally written by Gene Betancourt. The first two pages were altered by Andrew Hussey, pretending to be Dirk Strider. The rest of the pages were altered by Sonnet Stuck, also pretending to be Dirk Strider. The book is read by Duckface as yet another person pretending to be Dirk Strider, and Naked Bee as Gene Betancourt, a fourth character who may or may not be Dirk Strider. This recording was instigated, perpetrated, and assembled by Naked Bee.